I am surgeon, as you've uh, heard, and my talk today uh, will be how we use robotics in surgery, how we break these surgical barriers and obtain uh, better clinical outcomes for our patients and uh, for our family, for our friends. And also, I will talk about a new trend in surgery, and this is incisionless surgery, surgery without incisions. So there is surgery performed today uh, with no incision in the abdominal wall, uh, just through the mouth, through the natural orifices. So I've started uh, my medical school uh, here in uh, Romania, uh, and I finished here, and that was uh, 20, 20 years ago. And I have learned the first surgery techniques in open surgery. Open surgery really is advantage, has an advantage because you can uh, incise large in the abdomen, you can introduce your hands, you can introduce, uh, you know, the instruments, you have all the wrists movement inside, so you can perform complex surgery. But it's not so good for the patient because you have many infection, you have many uh, bleeding, a lot of bleeding, so uh, then the surgery moved to the next generation to laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery is when you introduce the camera and the instruments to, through the ports inside the abdomen. So it's less invasive, uh, less blood, uh, less infection, uh, but it's not so, you cannot perform so complex surgery. And here is the interesting, the third generation of surgery is the robotic surgery. Robotic surgery allows me for the first time, when I've heard about this, was 20 years ago when I was in Paris. Uh, it was uh, not 20, 10 years ago, there was a congress in Paris. And then when I met in Paris, some surgeons coming from the United States, from California, uh, where this robotic surgery company was based. And they had technology from NASA, uh, from Stanford Research Institute of Medicine, from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And that was pretty interesting how today I have a robot in the operating room between my hands and the patient. So I'm not touching the patient, but the robot will allow me to do more complex surgery. It allow me to do a safer surgery. It will, you know, uh, just uh, eliminate my um, involuntary tremblement of the hands. And so I can do more complex surgery. And then the last part of my talk will be incisionless surgery, how we perform today's surgery even with no incisions. So when we've started, I have really pledged and I swear to treat my patients as Hippocrates said uh, 2,000 years ago. I solemnly pledge to consecrate my life uh, to the service of humanity. That was 20 years ago here in Romania when I finished my medical school. Then I went to France in Paris and there I've learned the techniques of laparoscopic surgery. And there I swear, this time in French, when I was accepted in the, the French College of Surgeons, that I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity. And then two years ago when I moved to the United States and then I was admitted as a fellow at the American College of Surgeons, I also pledge and swear uh, that the health and the life of my patient will be my first consideration. And this is what Hippocrates told 2000, more than 2000 years ago. What Hippocrates knew uh, was that uh, really uh, the human being will not change. Uh, what he didn't knew uh, was that robotic now will be uh, coming and interposing between the surgeon and the patient. So this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting um, uh, what robotic surgery can do today. Uh, now, um, I have a funny story, so I went to uh, my uh, mechanical car and I said, hey, he fixed my car. And I said, look, uh, it's quite expensive uh, and uh, I don't think you have the same responsibility. You are pay you much higher than I got pay in my medical practice. And he answered to me, well, uh, your model hasn't changed since Adam and Eve. My models come new every year, so I have to keep up with speed because I have new models and change. And that, that's really true because uh, there are new models, so, but it was not true because the robotic surgery comes now and changed this. So these are the first four uh, stages of surgery, the open surgery, the minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery, and incisionless uh, surgery. The first, the surgery started 7,000 years ago with this treponation. So it was a guy 
uh, healer that they call, and he has this curiosity to see what's in your head, what could be in your head. So he make a hole in a head to see what's there. I'm wondering what was in his head when he thought this. But really, this is how surgery started 7,000 years ago. And during this period, from this kind of surgery, and now up to robotic surgery, there was a lot, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of new uh, discovering. This was presented in a congress in France, and that was um, uh, 10 years ago when we started the robotic surgery. And this is really what, uh, what bothered me, if there is a bug, if the robot, robot is in the operating room and is a bug, who is the pilot? Who can manage this? So hopefully this will not, uh, will, not, uh, will not arrive, but we have to work under stress. And when we work under stress, I don't know if you are familiar with Code Blue. Code Blue probably is not very familiar, but we as the surgeons in the hospital, when you are uh, in Code Team, um, you can hear a nice voice in the hospital and say, Code Blue, third floor, uh, room 467. Uh, well, this means to protect all the visitors in the hospital. They don't need to know that somebody is dying in that room. But I know, as a surgeon in the hospital, if there is code blue, and if it's on the third floor, room 467, I have to run there because I have to start the CPR. So you have to know to work under stress, and this is, uh, this is what's happened uh, every day uh, in our practice. This is the first surgery that we've done in Stockholm with the team there. I collaborated with them. First uh, incisionless surgery, when you introduce, when we've introduced all the instruments through the mouth into the abdomen, and we've created the first operation in Europe uh, that uh, had no incisions. This was robotic surgery, the first kidney transplantation that I used the robot uh, to operate on a kidney, to remove that kidney and suture the kidney. And that was in Henri Mondor Hospital uh, in Paris, and we had a huge success with this. That was the first incisionless surgery. We worked with teams in Portugal, in Lisbon, and also uh, that was a bariatric surgery for, uh, for weight surgery. So we could uh, treat a patient who had morbid obesity, who is really, really uh, 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 cause of death today. Uh, this helps also telementoring and telesurgery. We had teams also in Dubai, in Middle East. We were in contact with him in New York, so we've treated patients. You have images that are going from one side to the other, so we can talk between us and treat those patients with other colleagues in different, in different operating rooms. And that was a huge success here in Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, in the United States, Henry Ford family, when we've launched the first robotic surgery, their program in Detroit. I used to fly from Paris every month for one week there and work with marvelous teams there and perform the first robotic surgery in the United States for a cancer of prostate. Now, the surgery evolved, and this is the first heart transplantation. Of course, the advantages of general surgery, of open surgery, is that the surgeon, I can introduce my hands inside the body. I can operate. I have all degrees of freedom. I can see what I do. But for the patient, it's very bad because the patient has pain. Well, we, we control better the pain today, but can be risk of bleeding, can be risk of infection. Those patients stay for one week or two weeks in the hospital and they go home. But this is really what had to be improved. Another break, uh, surgical uh, breaks in the surgery, and this is a photo that I really like, a presentation when I was at the American College of Surgeons that was a few weeks ago in uh, Chicago. And that was a surgeon who presented this in 1981. A surgeon in San Francisco, a GYN, treated for the first time, and that was another breaking in surgical practice, to treat an unborn baby in uh, the abdomen of his mother in the uterus at the end of the procedure, really, uh, really the, the unborn baby say, hello doc, thank you very much, and then he, uh, he, he, uh, he uh, closed the, uh, the abdomen. Now, these are the incisions that we are practicing with open surgery. This had to change, and that started to change by late 80s when we start with laparoscopic surgery. This is laparoscopic surgery. I have now huge instruments, I mean long instruments. Uh, I'm not so precise because of trembling, I'm, but I can do some surgery, some not so complex surgery. Uh, imagine yourself uh, grabbing a pencil long, about 30, 40 centimeter, and writing grabbing from one side and then write your name or signature. You cannot be very precise. But we could, dump, uh, could do some surgeries like uh, gallbladder, like uh, appendectomies. 
that was good for the patient because the recovery time is much faster. That's good for the patient because there is no more bleeding, less bleeding, there is less uh, infection, there is less pain, but it's not so good for the surgeon. I don't have hand and eye alignment. I, I have to watch a screen in two dimension. So it takes a lot of uh, uh, fine surgery uh, for me when I do this. But these are, these are the scars. There are no more scars, big scars in the abdomen. So there are only two or three scars, about one centimeter each. So that's the advantage of the patient. But we have a surgeon to be trained on this. Now, to overcome these drawbacks of laparoscopic surgery in which is good for the patient but not so good for me because I cannot do the complex surgery came the robotic surgery and the robotic surgery will put between my hands and the patient will put a robot, a computer that will help me uh, to create more precise movement, to dissect better uh, to remove organs, to make sure that I not leave any cancer or any cell inside. So that now helps the surgeon and helps me very much to do uh, really the, um, uh, the surgery. This is the, uh, the, the robot, the Da Vinci robot, and we have used this uh, robot uh, to do radical prostatectomy, cancer of prostate, uh, cancer of uterus. We have used this to do coronary artery bypass without opening the chest, without opening, without sternotomy. Sternotomy really breaks the bone, so it takes a lot of time for healing. But now with this kind of surgery, uh, we just put three incisions. I uh, set up the robot, I have a checklist, there is a checklist like the pilot, like in the cockpit, you have the checklist, you make sure for safety reason the robot will be set up with every single movement, with every single procedure that I will do, I will hit the button if it's cardiac surgery, I will hit the button if it's general surgery or urology surgery or cancer of the prostate and the robot will integrate this and then I can start uh, operating. I'm sitting at this console. This console is like a cockpit. It's like, um, um, uh, like a cockpit where I can uh, use my joysticks and move the instruments inside the body. The patient does not need to be in the same operating room. I can be in another room, in another hospital, or even another building. That was the first robotic surgery that we do. That was back in September 2001 when the surgeon, uh, the operating surgeon at the council was in New York, not in a hospital, in a building, because the council does not need to be in an operating room. And the patient was in France, in Strasbourg. That was called a Lindbergh operation and that was a transatlantic operation. So that allows me not only to operate at distance patients, but also allows me uh, to, um, uh, to have more precision, uh, more precision with, uh, with the robotic instruments. This is a hysterectomy, and I have a 3D image. As you see here, I have two cameras. I can navigate with the camera inside the body. I can move the camera, I can zoom in, I can zoom out, I can see even anatomies in the body that I cannot see with the eyes. So the robot not only will give me a three-dimensional HD image, but also will allow me to navigate with the camera, and I can remove the cancer, I can remove the, 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 uh, the uterus, uh, as in this image, or other procedure, like here, with zoom two times or three times, or even 15 times magnification, so I can see the cells, and allows me a more precise surgery, uh, like here in the gastric bypass. Uh, also, what you see here, I have with the robot, I can uh, use different scales of motion. So I hit the button, when I do the checklist, I just hit the button of the robot and place what scale motion I need. So for precise movement, I will use scale 5 to 1. So that means 5 centimeters here of my hand at the joysticks will allow 1 centimeter inside the body. So I can really, really uh, uh, have precise surgery with this, uh, with this setup. Here, I'm inside the heart. When you see here, it's the scope inside the heart. The heart is open, the scope is inside, the instruments are inside. So I can do much more, uh, less invasive surgery inside the heart, where the heart, I'm just immersed in the heart patient with my hands inside, with the wrists inside, with my eyes inside, although I'm a distance from, those pa from, from that patient, but I can do precise surgery, complex surgery, and the robot, uh, the robot helps me for this. This is a cancer of prostate. 
I'm really deep in the pelvis of the, of the, of the patient. Uh, I can see almost every uh, cancer cells because the image is magnified, because I have the 3D. So even if I'm minimally invasive, I can really do complex surgery because the robot will allow me to do this. Will eliminate my tremor. For safety reason, the robot will stop will send me signals, uh, beeps or audio signals or visual signals in which they say, hey, here you are not secure, you are not safe for the patient, you have to stop. And that all the signals are transmitted in my console, in the stereo viewer, so I can see, I can stop and I can listen to the robot because I believe uh, in what the robot is doing, although I am conducting the robot, uh, but it's, it's preset and he, uh, it, it knows how to work. Uh, the telementoring also with the robot allows me to train students, to train other physicians, other surgeons uh, that are uh, less trained in surgery, and I can work with them. They can have another console. They can uh, um, uh, put that console uh, with my robotic arms in the patient so he can help me or I can help him even if it's another hospital, even if it's another uh, in another continent or some, somewhere else. So that also is a breaking in the surgery barriers because I can operate a distance and we can be two surgeons or three surgeons, two or three consoles uh, correlated with the same robotic arms and the robotic um, uh, instruments, uh, surgical instruments in the body. Uh, here is the telementoring and some pictures and some videos. So you see there are different surgeons that are operating and that, uh, that's very, very um, um, helpful because I can, you know, I can ask, uh, hey, take these two minutes of the procedure and do it by yourself because I think this is better for the patient. Here is how we change the instrument in the robot. So the, the, the robot, the robotic arms will have memory. So the robotic arm will go exactly at the level of the organ where it was. It's no risk to penetrate the organ, has memory and can go down exactly uh, where it has to be uh, in order to continue the procedure. Here is the cockpit with the surgical checklist. There is a checklist uh, uh, I do before every surgery. I enter in the robot. I know what to enter. I know my 3D vision. I know the robotic arms. I know what kind of procedure I need to do. Uh, and this is, uh, this is how it comes. And this is how I see in the cockpit, in the console. This is how I see. I don't see only the image. And here is the aorta, what you see there. But I also see the uh, echogram of the patient. I also see the pulse. I see the blood pressure. Uh, I see the image outside in the OR. I see also the robotic arms, how they are performing. So this is really also helpful. Uh, this is single, single port surgery, so I can introduce the arms in only from one port, and this is much more complex to do the surgery uh, with this, uh, with this uh, single port. This is one uh, gallbladder surgery uh, through one incision through the umbilicus. All the robotic arms are going through one single incision into the umbilicus, and I can do, I can do the surgery. Here is the difference, the scar bit 4, classic surgery and robotic surgery. Uh, so you can see you can see the difference. Here we put the robotic arms on uh, aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle in France, and we work with French Army and with NASA with technology. So we put the robot there. We stayed at the console in the Paris, and we could operate some patients on the Charles de Gaulle. And here you can see an operating room from Charles de Gaulle uh, uh, aircraft carrier. Um, here is the simulation. I can be trained and I can do the simulation so I can prepare myself to better operate the patient, not to risk the patient life, but I can learn the procedure before uh, and I can train myself. So also that helps me to be safer and uh, helps me to give better clinical outcomes for, uh, for the patient with this uh, simulation. And the last one uh, will be the natural, uh, natural orifice surgery. Here is the new trend in surgery I'm working with, with teams from Stanford, with teams from California, from Silicon Valley. And we, the trend today, and this is what will be tomorrow, will be surgery without incision. I have now flexible instruments. I have scissors. I have needle holders. It's flexible. I can go through the mouth. I can go inside the abdomen, I can do some surgery, not so complex today, but I can do some surgery, then take out, remove all the instruments, remove the organs, and then the patient just go home. Even the family doctor, when he sees those patients, says no scar in the abdomen, is questioning if this patient really had surgery or no. Um, 
So this is also, uh, this is also how, how it works with, uh, with natural orifice surgery. Here is a procedure also in natural orifice surgery, incision, no incision on those patients. It's so unbelievable how the patient will wake up after the anesthesia, will go home, and he just goes back to work the next day and, and no, no pain, no risk of bleeding, and uh, no infection. Uh, also, what we work now with the technology companies, with venture capitalists to raise money and to, uh, to make some instruments even more flexible, to go even further in the abdomen and do some more complex surgery. And these instruments will be delivered through teeny channels. Uh, they will be flexible and I can, I can perform now a little bit more complex surgery. And this is the research I'm working now in, uh, in, uh, in Stanford. So this is my last slide. And the message today for you is that Today, we are working as surgeons to give you better clinical outcomes. Uh, what you want as a patient, you want to come to me, you want a fast surgery, you want no incision, you want to stay in the hospital uh, less time possible, you want to go home without pain, without medication. So this is what we are working on. Uh, it's funny what, what patient uh, asked me uh, a, few, um, a few months ago and he said, hey, doctor, how, uh, how can I live? Uh, what's the secret to live 100 years? And I say, well, try to um, uh, give up to rich food, to junk food, try to exercise half an hour or one hour a day. And the patient really asked me, well, and this will really help me to get to 100 uh, years? And I said, well, probably no, uh, but uh, it seemed like uh, 100 years if you do this. Thank you. Amazing.